Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. It was one of the most toxic weed killers ever used. And their swags and everything used to get soaked with the poison. 20 years ago, it was banned. How many of those men are still alive? Not very many, and if any, they're sick. But are deadly dioxins still in use today? We actually didn't believe the results. We said there must have been a cross-contamination because these levels are not possible anymore today. chemical weapon we turned on ourselves. Welcome to Four Corners. The Vietnam War generation will remember Agent Orange, a chemical cocktail that became notorious as a defoliant used in aerial bombardments against the Viet Cong. Its legacy of death and deformity is well documented. It was made up of the chemicals 245T and 24D. Subsequently it was found that these chemicals contained dioxin, a dangerous cancer agent or carcinogen. These same chemicals were also widely used throughout Australia in the 1970s and 80s for weed control, with results that will shock you when we detail them tonight. 245T was banned in the 90s after links with cancer and other side effects were revealed. The high presence of dioxin was blamed. 24D was regarded as more benign because it was thought to contain no more than trace elements of dioxin. Weeds are a curse across the nation, a major threat to biodiversity and a crippling cost to landowners, an estimated $4 billion a year. As a result, 2,4-D is still used widely. Tonight's program will show evidence that 2,4-D can contain levels of dioxin that could be harmful, particularly if it's imported from countries like China and India. It includes data the government regulator was not aware of. The reporter is Janine Cohen, and you may find some of the images in the story disturbing. Thirty-one-year-old Nigel Sinclair is in the last stage of terminal cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Nigel and his family believe he's soon to be the latest legacy from a chemical exposure which they say has killed his father, his uncle and many of their mates. Well, think hopefully it'd be nice to be able to get it all out. Before Nigel dies, he wants to know how a tragedy like this could happen. At this very late stage, what would be the very best outcome for you? No, it's like, in, like answers, really, just to, so my nana can rest and you know, I can rest and my, me and my family can rest and put it to rest. I'm lucky that he's still with us and still going. He has his moment where he'd like to have his closure. Back in the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of men were employed by the various state governments around the country to spray noxious weeds. Today, many are sick and many are dead. A lot of the boys end up being the same, fading away near enough to nothing. Doctors turn and just, yeah, feed your medication, kill the pain. You're right, you'll be right. And next thing you know, they're dead. Nigel's father was one of about 320 men in the West Australian Kimberley who sprayed herbicides for the state's Agriculture Protection Board, or APB. Now, there are reports of the sprayer's partners and children getting sick. I think that they should have a close look, epidemiologically and clinically, at the children of those APB workers. I think that they should suspect that they'll have huge problems to deal with. 
Mr Hunter, Nigel's father, was one of many Indigenous men who joined the government spraying teams. They just work from sun up to sundown for what pay they got, little knowing that they're going to die later on in later years. What the men didn't know was the herbicides they were spraying from backpacks were the same chemicals used to make Agent Orange in the Vietnam War, 245T and 24D, which were contaminated with dangerous dioxins. Poison was carried on the same vehicle as their water drums and their swags and everything. We used to get soaked with the poison. They slept in it, worked in it for 10 days at a time. Then all their clothes will get washed at home. It wasn't an accidental spill on any work day. Their bodies were exposed to the herbicide all day. And I'm not talking about eight hours in the day, but 24 hours a day, every day, every week, for months and years. I can't conceive of anywhere where the exposure has been so intense and at such a level and for so long. One of the workers, Carl Drysdale, said they would cut the drums of chemicals in the back of a four-wheel drive like this one. The sprayers would go into the bush for 10 days at a time. For the first few years, the men were given no protective clothing. Most of the people would be wearing what was appropriate for the heat, which would be shorts and thongs and T-shirts, you know. A few years after spraying the chemicals, many of the men began to get sick. Now, in the beginning, what were you told about the chemicals? How safe were they? Harmless. So harmless you could drink it. That's what they told you? That's right. Who told you that? Oh, all the bosses, all the head charangs. But Carl Drysdale, who was the foreman, felt responsible for his men and he was getting worried. They all got rashes, everybody got rashes, headaches, and I guess internal bleeding was uh, another pretty universal thing, like they were vomiting blood and passing blood. Carl wrote to his superiors in June 1982 about his concerns. A manager from the West Australian Agriculture Protection Board wrote back saying that 245T was not considered dangerous if used as recommended and that he did not support staff undertaking their own research. You're told that the stuff's harmless, so you think, well, you know, I'm probably wrong, so you give them the benefit of the doubt, you know? And that was a mistake to trust, to trust the government, you know? The job was a perfect job for them, and they loved that kind of environment. Maybe if it had been a white person, they most probably would have stood up and said, well, I'm not spraying this, this doesn't smell nice, I'm getting a rash, I'm getting sores, I'm not touching this anymore. Well, if they wouldn't, they didn't want to lose their job. After years of spraying, Mr Hunter became so ill that he could no longer work and was often bedridden. He had sores all over his body, respiratory problems, dramatic weight loss and extreme fatigue. His black arms were dyed white or bleached white where that poison came in contact. He had great big lumps under his jaw. Uh, from his glands, under his arms, and he told me in his groin, um, his general health was so bad that he couldn't get up the stairs at work to get his pay. At 33, Mr Hunter died in his sleep. He was the first of the Kimberley men to die, but others soon followed. How many of those men are still alive? Uh, not very many. And if any, they're sick, sick today. Mainly headaches, but at the moment, yeah. For more than 30 years, Carl Drysdale has been fighting to get workers' compensation for the surviving men. Kept me awake all night last night. When you're going to see the doctor, the doctor I told the doctor... Carl himself has not been able to work since 1985 because of a range of illnesses, 
he believes were linked to the spraying. His wife Marion has had to support him and their four children. Carl has suffered from just about everything you can suffer from and I've seen the, the physical decline in this powerful, energetic man since he finished with the APB. Uh, just one big enough for this lot will do. I had, like, constant heart attacks, unconscious. Well, they told my wife I was going to die over and over again. Five black spots on my lungs. I've used cortisone cream for uh, uh, rashes that's ruined my bones. OK. And you just hold it level with your heart there. Okay. Dr Randolph Spargo was a local GP and saw many of the sprayers, including Carl Drysdale. So it's definitely abnormal, Carl, but uh, much better than it used to be. Have you got any doubt all these years later that it was the chemicals that made a lot of these men sick and in some cases killed them? No doubt about it. I wouldn't go near that herbicide. The herbicides were contaminated with dangerous dioxins. Chemical Industries Quinana in Perth imported some of these chemicals, which were supplied to the West Australian Agriculture Protection Board. According to the normal toxicity... Rate. In 1978, Four Corners reporter Andrew Ollie interviewed the owner, the late Robert Telford. But it's not a commercial problem. What do you mean it's not a commercial problem? It's because it's not possible for a person using commercial 245T containing these minute infinitesimal quantities of dioxin to be poisoned by them. How do you know that? The toxicity becomes meaningless in the dilution. A few years later, Professor Ben Salinger, a former head of chemistry at the Australian National University, traced some of the chemicals to Singapore, where one batch had been fire damaged. The normal herbicide would have been light in colour and fairly fluid. The sample we had from the tariff board was clunky and black, so it would appear that there was a good chance they were using the stuff that we also looked at. All of a sudden, at least 30, 44 gallon drums of concentrate arrived and it was completely different to the stuff in the 20 litre drums. The stuff in the 20 litre drums was like engine oil and, or honey, you know, colour. And the next lot came, it was black and thick and it blocked up all the nozzles. And 30 drums was enough for at least 20 years. Tests on a sample of the fire-damaged chemical later revealed it had 200 times the allowable level of dioxin then and more than 2,000 times the levels permitted in later years. Well, I think it would have been very dangerous. It was much higher than what was used in Vietnam. And at those levels, I think they were really exposed to a high level of risk. The men continued to die. They die with that sort of lingering question mark hanging over, why has this happened to me, you know? And to see that is terrible. In 2001, occupational work specialist Dr Andrew Harper was asked to investigate if the men's illnesses were linked to chemical exposure. Dr Harper says the government's Agriculture Protection Board repeatedly failed in its duty of care. One, they were not trained. Two, there wasn't an induction program. The information about the risk was not given to them. The supervision was not there. And they were not given, in the main, safety equipment. So they simply went out in shorts and shirts and thongs, and that was it. And there wasn't any systematic washing after exposure. So they were just completely exposed. And the authorities didn't take a responsible stand to, in fact, uh, correct the situation. Dr Harper recommended all those who were sick be considered for compensation. I recommended that compensation be considered, as I felt there had been a disservice done to these people. And it wasn't only manifest in a specific illness. 
which was difficult to define, it was manifest through the way they were treated and through the impact that that had on their lives and on their feelings of alienation. But the West Australian Labor government responded to Dr Harper's recommendation by calling for another report. Asking for a scientific study created a distraction from the content of my report. That the men be compensated. That the men be compensated. It diverted attention away from all of the injustices of the whole program. It diverted attention away from the suffering that these people had and it diverted attention away from the moral issues that the whole thing uh, exemplifies. Former Agricultural Minister Kim Chance commissioned the new report. But Harper's report took us a long way because we began from a, a situation where we were trying to uncover the results of an event that occurred 20 years before. Harper's report allowed us to tie those events together. He, he said, look, it looks like there's a cause and effect issue here. He was a lot stronger than that. He uh, recommended yeah. that you consider compensation for all those men. Yes. He found a failure of duty of care by yes. various governments. Yes. He found that there was no protective clothing, that yes. these chemicals were suspected of being incredibly toxic mm. and no training. Why did you need statistics to compensate the men when you had all oh. that before you? Because our means of compensation uh, is, is the work safe principles or the work cover principles. That's the only means we have of compensating a former government worker. I'd like to get a jar of that poison and pour it down some of those politicians' mouth. Let them see how they feel about it. The new report recommended only men with cancer be eligible for compensation. Ten years later, only eight men have received workers' compensation. To effect what Dr Harper wanted us to do required a change in the law. Well, why didn't you change the law? Well, that's, that's a matter for the whole of government to deal with. That's way beyond the authority of the Minister for Agriculture. Dr Randolph Spargo said the men were actually poisoned. Yes, they were. They were. And they were told that the chemical that they were using couldn't possibly hurt them. In fact, they were it, told it was so safe they could drink it. They could drink it. I mean, mm. given all that, do you now, all these years later, mm. find it hard to reconcile that they were never compensated, not the great bulk of those men who got sick? Yes. In, yeah. If you could... And, and indeed, uh, I'll go further than that. I, I, I think Dr Harper's recommendation was the right recommendation. Yeah getting a rash on there too, and you saw red on that side. Despite this admission, nothing is likely to change for the children and partners of the sprayers, who believe they are now affected. Slowly. Slowly. Three years ago, Nigel Sinclair was diagnosed with lyomyosarcoma, which is growing on a muscle at the back of his liver. Studies have linked soft tissue sarcoma with toxic exposure from Agent Orange, which was equal parts 245T and 24D. Just battling to get up and walk around now. Just finding it hard to get out of bed and that, and how to get a new bed now, so... Yeah, and I'm more confined to a wheelchair. You put my shirt down now. No mother wants to watch their son deteriorate like this. And it's something that you can't fix, you know? Can't kiss it better, can't put a band-aid on it. And I just gotta watch him. And I don't, I don't like to. Gotta try and keep strong. More than three decades ago, when Sue Sinclair was pregnant with Nigel, she used to wash his father's chemical drenched clothes. After Nigel was born, she would put his nappies in the wash with his father's work gear and Nigel would crawl all over his father and his swag. Horrible to think that I might have passed something on to my son. I'd take that away from him any day and put it on myself. It's hard. If dioxin was present, 
the residual level of dioxin in the clothes need not be very high to be potentially harmful. And these chemicals have got the potential to damage genes and produce an adverse effect in the next generation. Uh, and this is a real concern. Of the 77 workers Dr Harper interviewed, 58% reported having fertility problems, stillbirths and premature births. There were 12 reports of birth defects. Some of the blokes have described what their children look like and I won't, I won't even say what they've said about their own children, what they look like. And uh, Why? What, 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 what was wrong? They look wrong? like monsters, you know, like, because of the deformities that they had. Back in 1976, on the other side of the country, in the small rural town of Yarram in Victoria's Gippsland, a cluster of birth defects was found by a local GP. So in other words, it appeared to have been shelved. Dr Rod Guy told Four Corners he believed the deformities might be linked to heavy spraying of 245T and 24D. Well, we made a list of, uh, of the abnormalities, the problems we'd had. I'd had some really awful things happen, which were really unusual. A baby born without a brain, a baby born without kidneys. Now, in general practice, it's um, unusual to have serious birth defects. The Victorian government held an inquiry in 1978. The disappointing thing was that I thought that, that the um, inquiry was really very superficial and I think, to be honest, rushed to get a political answer. The inquiry dismissed concerns that the chemicals were potentially dangerous and found that the cluster of birth defects in Yarram could have happened by chance. Two years later, Professors Ben Salinger and Peter Hall found that there were serious statistical errors with that finding. Well, Peter Hall is probably one of Australia's best statisticians and he did that work and showed that the way they did their comparisons would have minimised anything showing up. And when he redid the work using their data, he showed a very high and strong correlation. So in other words, they were saying that there wasn't a disproportionate number of birth abnormalities. That's right. yeah. And his results showed that there were a very high proportion of, of, of birth abnormalities. Yeah, all clear there from the left. Yep. Molly Dunn believes she knows more than most in Yarram about the toxic aftermath of spraying 245T and 24D. Yep. Thank you. She had a stillborn baby five months into a pregnancy. Terrible. Yes. At the time, her husband Percy Dunn was a sprayer for the Victorian Lands Department at Yarram. They didn't actually have protective clothing back then. No uh, clothes, no masks, no um, nothing much. You know? Percy Dunn died of cancer in 1980. The 60-year-old had been ill for many years after spraying the herbicides in paddocks and along creeks to kill blackberries and ragwort weed infestations. Two years after he died, Molly took the Victorian government to court and was awarded $17,500 in workers' compensation. But no liability was admitted. All these years later, she's still grieving his death. Oh, I miss him a lot. Especially at first day, you know, with her. I still think of him and everything. Yeah, it was hard back then. It was. Percy Dunn's family is believed to be the only one in Yarram to have received government compensation. Do you think it's wrong that families like yours only get compensation when they're prepared to go to court? Yeah, well... That's the government, isn't it? They don't want to pay out anything, unless they have to. And there'd be surpluses in those drums too. And, uh, it's very similar to the asbestos cases that I've been involved in. Uh, the denial is put forward, and the worker's got a battle uh, to prove beyond reasonable doubt 
And it's very hard to do in chemical cases. In Yarram, many of the sprayers have died. Very short breath, though. Yeah, well, oh, me too. But... Tony Cassidy yeah. and Pat Reed are the lucky ones. <laughs> Sick, but still alive. Anyway, he's looking at you, Doc. Right over. I've got cancer of the bladder. In fact, I've got to go tomorrow for more exploratory surgery. How many of your mates that you used to spray with have been sick or have died? Oh. Well, all of them are sick. Some are probably not as sick as me, but uh, they're all sick. And I'd say probably 75% of them have, have died. Any bruise, well, you've got it all over you. You're wet through some bloody days. What, just covered in the stuff? Yeah. Sprayer Pat Reed thinks he was unwittingly dragged into a cover up when he was told by his boss to bury about 80 of the drums on Crown land just outside of Yarram. Tree over there, the clean one. Oh, right, okay. About there. About there? Yeah. Pat took us to the site of where he buried them more than 30 years ago. This is where the driver of the truck put the truck there. And I, and I uh, dug the hole in around here somewhere. We'll try just here. OK. They put the axe, threw them up on the truck and threw them into the hole and I crunched them up with the dozer and then filled it all in. Nothing there. We knew there was something going on, digging a hole out here to put drums in, so something funny. Out in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. That's it. That's the barrels, Pat? Yes, that's the barrels. Why do you think the Lands Department asked the men to bury the drums? Because the heat was on, uh, get rid of them. We don't want them on the, on the premises because people were starting to sniff around and ask questions. It should never have been used for manual spraying or aerial spraying. It was a poison that you couldn't contain. It wasn't until the 1990s that 245T, which was thought to be more toxic than 24D, was banned by all states in Australia. This was some years after the United States took it off its market. What made 245T so toxic was the heating of the reaction mixture during manufacture, which created dangerous dioxins. You can not ensure that dioxins are not being formed even, even if you employ the best production processes. I think this is one of the reasons why 245T was banned, because um, what you require is an additional step, which is a purification step, and that is relatively costly. D kills the entire weed, roots and all. What many people don't realise is that the second chemical in Agent Orange 24D, which was developed in the 1940s, is still widely used. A plane dusts a field of young wheat with 24D. 24D is a cheap and effective weed killer. The destruction of many weeds is complete. There are more than 200 24D products registered in Australia. It's used in many agricultural applications. It's used in pastures uh, and cropland for broadleaf control. It's also used in areas that people probably wouldn't expect, such as uh, turf spraying uh, for sporting fields, um, for councils in their cosmetic applications, uh, for verges and those sorts of things. Many of the major chemical companies are represented by a peak body, CropLife Australia. Weeds are a massive cost. Um, if you had to manage them in other ways, we're talking, you know, just for a normal farm, thousands of, of, of work hours. Hey there. Hi. So Hello. this is the sample. Great. It's generally assumed that there's no dangerous dioxins in 24D due to today's improved manufacturing standards. But three years ago, a team of Queensland scientists set out to prove there were no dioxins in pesticides and were amazed at what they discovered. 
we actually didn't believe the results. We said there must have been a cross-contamination because these levels are not possible anymore today. They were, for some of the pesticides, similar to what was known from 245T, which was banned in the 80s, 90s. Associate Professor Carolyn Gow sent her researchers back to the laboratory to repeat the tests. And when they returned positive, she expanded the study to include other pesticides, including 2,4-D. Tests on one 2,4-D product came back showing moderate levels of dioxins. This product was made by a Brisbane company, but it may have had its active ingredient imported. There's no way of knowing, as the regulator classifies this as commercial incompetence. Many Australian companies today import their active ingredients from countries like China and India. What that really means is that it depends on the manufacturer as well as the year of manufacture, as well as the batch or the country of manufacture on how much dioxin you actually produce or have left as an impurity in the 2,4-D formulation. Yeah, something's happening. We've been told many, many times over the years that industry has cleaned up its act, that they have new processing equipment, new techniques, new technology that will eliminate dioxin from their herbicides and therefore from our environment. But uh, I think the latest studies that are showing these contaminant levels uh, indicate that that's not the case, that industry hasn't come clean about the nature of uh, the contaminants of dioxin in 2,4-D and the government really needs to take a close look at this. Despite the low to moderate levels found in 2,4-D, its widespread use rang alarm bells. So if you have a moderate toxicity but you use very high volumes, then the risk is, could be the same as having very high toxicity but very vol low volume of use. 2,4-D was tested and the level of dioxins that were found were lower than elsewhere in the world. So that gave us some comfort. And that gave you some comfort? Some some comfort. That um, they had, they found moderate levels of dioxin in 2,4-D. That it was low to moderate. The regulator, the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, decided to see for itself if dioxins were present. It repeated the Queensland tests. The APVMA came in and also tested for dioxins in a range of chemicals mm -hmm. and we worked with the health department as well in assessing the outcomes of that. And uh, did, When you tested, did you find dioxins as well? Um, from, I understand that when the testing was done we did find some levels of dioxins and that's when it's been referred to the health department. Did you find it in 2,4-D? I would have to... I don't know the answer to that question. Exposure to dioxin is consistent with this pattern of adverse health effects and I think that there are solid scientific reasons to be concerned about dioxin exposures following 2,4-D use. Four Corners decided to test for dioxin contamination in one of the many imported products. We purchased 2,4-D weed killer from this warehouse in Sunshine just outside of Melbourne and sent it to government laboratories for testing. The 2,4-D weed killer, Aminoz 625, was imported from China by an Australian company, Senonda, based in an office in Melbourne. We purchased the 2,4-D weed killer which is often sold direct to farmers, no questions asked. It's almost three weeks on and we've just received our results from the government laboratory. Alarmingly, our sample of 2,4-D weed killer came back with dioxin levels almost seven times higher than those found by the Queensland scientists. And what's even more disturbing is we don't know how many contaminated 2,4-D products are out there in the community because authorities are not routinely testing. Four Corners gave the results to Associate Professor Carolyn Gauss to analyse. I was actually surprised because you only analysed one formulation and actually returned such a high result. I thought it was unlikely today, but again, that is a reality check when we think back to our previous study where we actually didn't expect any contamination in the pesticides, it just demonstrates again that what we're seeing today is equally or even worse than 10 to 20 years ago and that is of concern of course.
Each year, more than $100 million worth of 2,4-D products are sold in Australia. And we don't know which ones contain imported ingredients. We have seen a new scenario develop in Australia with high Australian dollar, massive production increase in places like China and fairly free trade between the two countries that a large amount of product is now coming in. The country of origin, as I suggested, doesn't automatically imply good or bad. Um, what we do need to ensure is that we deal with reliable suppliers. But it's not just about having a reliable supplier. Scientists say we should be monitoring for dioxins in all pesticides. And that's the job of the regulator. Without monitoring each of the batches or regular monitoring, we pretty much don't have um, any chance to really realise what is being on the market and how much of the dioxin is being released with pesticide use. The APVMA hasn't found any evidence of high levels of dioxin in imported chemicals. Are you testing for it? We, the APVMA doesn't do independent testing, however, it is concerns about potential quality of imported goods is often referred to us from many different sources. But how do you know if they've got dangerous dioxins in them? If there were high levels of dioxins, it would affect the final chemical and we would be seeing, we would expect to see in the public use concerns about the, the efficacy or the um, chemical itself and we're not seeing that. Who should test for dioxin in these imports, the companies or the regulator? Well, I would suggest that any regulatory system should have an independent testing regime to it. We also don't know how much 2,4-D is being sprayed around Australia. The lack of volume data makes it really hard to make any kind of sensible risk management decisions. If you've got a chemical where there's an identified problem and you don't know how much is being used or where it's used or in what circumstances it's being used, it's very difficult to develop sensible regulatory, uh, to make sensible regulatory decisions. I would suggest to you those who are advocating the need for it don't realise that it's actually not necessary or in fact you're just going to bury the regulator in data and them not able to make a good decision. Regardless of how much is sprayed, it's too much for David Brewer, an organic wine producer in South Australia's Riverland. Last year at Loxton he lost his entire harvest because 2,4-D sprayed on another property drifted onto his grapes. David Brewer used to lecture in chemistry at Roseworthy Agricultural College in South Australia. It's a foreign chemical. It's something that we would have no part of, and yet it's on our grapes. It's on our sultanas. And it can only have come from somebody else's property. It's a trespass. Tests found that David Brewer's table grapes had very small residues of 2,4-D. But he's concerned it could have been one of the cheaper generic imported products. What is it about these imported 2,4-D products that are so attractive? Well, A, they're cheap. They're cheaper to start with and B, they go further. So they're more efficient, if you like, in killing weeds but more effective in contaminating other properties as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a real problem. Like, once it's finished at their place, it comes over here and has a go at ours. There was a ban on spraying 2,4-D esters, the most prone to drift, at the time David Brewer's grapes were contaminated. It's almost impossible to trace the origins of vapour drift as it can travel up to 100 kilometres. Well, most cases of spray drift are usually because people aren't obeying the what's on the label, or it could be accidental. Not too many weeds, which is good. Two four D drift has damaged thousands of hectares of cotton, market gardens, and vineyards around the country. This South Australian market gardener who does not want to be named for fear of losing customers, says he's constantly losing produce from drift from farms as far as 10 kilometres away. The cosletters are growing nicely. 
bottom line is they can't use a chemical that does damage to other people. There is no compensation for anybody that gets damaged, so it should really be eliminated. You can again, you can see the weird growth deformations. It's got these protruding growths sticking out from the side of the tomato. This grower says the drift is causing many deformities in his vegetables. You've got female where they're supposed to be male, so they're mixed up with the pollen. And you also do get corn deformities where you'll get multiple cobs on a single cob. The mysterious part of it is that 2,4-D can render significant damage to a vineyard, a cherry orchard, a tomato field at levels that can't be measured in the air. It's that toxic to plants, particularly if the drift and exposure episode occurs when the plant is going through the fruiting stage. In other words, the plant's flowering, beginning to form fruit. Seven years ago, the Australian regulator put restrictions on when and how 2,4-D high volatile esters could be sprayed. But the complaints of drift continued. Curiously, the day Four Corners was to interview the regulator, it announced a proposed ban on high volatile esters. We're going through a show cause process to ask industry to come back to us with why these chemicals should still be available and from then we will make the decision about the future of the chemicals in Australia. But some believe a ban will not go far enough as there are other forms of 2,4-D that may drift that are still on the market. VMA started a review of 2,4-D in 1995 because of concerns about its potential harmful effects on humans, animals and the environment. It's yet to finish that review. Why do you announce that you're going to review a chemical in 1995 but you don't do anything until 2006? As I mentioned, I can't comment on what was behind that announcement. Um, typically when you um, Typically when you come to chemical review, uh, if you're concerned about a chemical, you do announce to the public that you are looking at such a chemical. 11 years ahead of time. That sort of time frame is perhaps uh, unusual. Australia's regulator must walk a fine line between arming farmers with the best tools and protecting the community from potentially dangerous chemicals. Today, there's almost 10,000 agricultural chemicals used in Australia. Some, like 2,4-D, have been around for generations. It is not acceptable that chemicals take 10 or 15 years for review when there have been identified problems with them. What are the risks? Well, the risks are that unsafe chemicals are being continually put in the environment, being used in farming communities, and we are eating those in the food that we eat. Some would say the time to take a risk with these old chemicals is over. Certainly, Nigel Sinclair and his family believed this. Tragically, Nigel never got the answers he was seeking. He died shortly after our interview. To borrow a saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. In this case, depressing. A response from the regulator, the APVMA, to the dioxin results we obtained is available on our website as is the response from Sananda, Australia. Last month, new legislation was passed by the Federal Parliament to make it mandatory for agricultural chemicals to be reviewed every seven to 15 years. Next week on Four Corners, the astounding rise and fall of Australia's youngest billionaire, Nathan Tinkler, and the people he trampled along the way. Until then, good night. <laughs>